Greetings, dear ones. I am Cryon of Magnetic Service. I know where I am. There are some things that are sacred, some more than not. This is one of those times when it's more than not. Through a series of song lines, it has led you to this place. And you're not going to sing one note until there is an understanding, a true revelation of where you sit. The ancestors may have given their permission for you to do this, but I say to you that I want you to give permission through your respect of what you're doing. I tell a story in order to give you a perspective you may not have no matter how long you have been in this land the days perhaps of preparation that you have given yourself still you need to hear the story it was a long time ago I want you to suspend all time and come with me and meet a woman. Her name is Amishaw. Now my partners does not say that correctly for he cannot. But the intent is there. And she is Ananu. My partner does not say that correctly. But the intent is there. And she sits making a meal for her family, and sitting next to her is her sister. She uses the traditional flat rock preparing the meal. There's always the plants, sometimes there's the meat. And this is her life. I'm not going to tell you a great deal about her, for that's going to come in another channel. What I want you to know is the time frame. She is proud, if you can use a word like that, that her spirit is everywhere and belongs everywhere. She is proud that her traditions and her information says that she is over 14,000 years old in her mob, in her tribe, 14,000. And she knows this not because of some calendar on the wall or even the counting of the six seasons. She knows it because of the stars. This is how time is measured. The pattern of the stars are consistent, and they tell the story. If you were to look around her as the breeze increases and the sun starts to set, it wouldn't look like it looks today. The plants are different. The animals are different. There's not as many insects. <laughs> 14,000 years old she is, not personally, but her lineage. Something is about to happen in the stars, and she knows it, called the precession of the equinoxes. To you, dear ones, it's the next to the last one. She knows of the 26,000 years to come. The wobble of the earth is known to the elders. All that the sky reveals each night is known to the elders. And this is her life. Come with me for a moment, for I wish to introduce you to someone called Amishaw, 10,000 years later. 10,000 years later. It is the same rock that she prepares the meal. 
She knows that her tribe, her mom, is 24,000 years old. Now it's time for you to examine, perhaps, your history in comparison to where she sits. And so I ask you, if you could look around the planet, what is happening that you might recognize? And the answer is nothing. For the history that you are taught in the Western world has not begun. And as I will teach you later, indeed, there are 11 other places on the planet where something similar is happening, but not like with Amishah. For she is pure and has been for 24,000 years where nothing has changed. Where women's business is the same. And the watchers of the rock are the same. Where the spirit is the same. And the stars move in the same way. Let me introduce you to a woman named Amishah 10,000 years later. The ancestry and the song lines speak of the age of her mob as being 34,000 years old. And she's using the same rock. The family has used it for all of those years. Indeed, Things look a little different. Perhaps the plants are a little larger. But the breeze is the same, and it sings among the rocks of their purity, and the song lines are as pure. Now I want you to look at your history. Right now, as she claims a 34,000-year-old lineage, there is stirring in the Indus Valley and in the Mesopotamian area where you think the cradle of life came from, Westerner. Just stirring. The ancient Egyptians are not ancient yet. Abraham is not born yet. It all will come in the next 10,000 years. Let me introduce you to a woman named Amishal 10,000 years later. She knows through the stars and the song lines that she is 44,000 years old. Her mob, her lineage, her purity has never changed. And in that 10,000 years, everything you know about history has taken place. And now the prophets have been born, and all that you believe is sacred has occurred. All that you believe that ever was took place in the last 10,000 years of a 44,000-year lineage from Amishal. The first note you sing, I want to know where you sit. I want you to know where you sit. I want you to really understand the profundity of what is here. But this is pure. Dear ones, the entire subject of nodes and nulls started here. And when I say here, I mean with this, the choir. Under the direction of Yah-E, the nodes and the nulls of the planet were outlined, for it was his job in order to generate the tones to open them. Some of you were there. 
And that place in Lemuria, where the signal was sent, it would tell the cosmos that you had arrived at this procession of the equinoxes fulfilling the prophecy of the ancients. What you did not know at that moment is that there were song lines all around the earth. Some of them were doing the same, not quite like you did. But some were silently appreciating the prophecy that you were fulfilling. And the choir has been instrumental in filling a gap to open the various sets and pairs of nodes and knolls of the planet ever since. Each choir has had a name. And the choirs have also been the place where you have identified the next pair. There are four pairs that have an identified. There will be another pair yet today. But it's been a mystery to so many of you, an elusive idea. What are they, these nodes, these knolls? How do they play into the general scheme? This is the creation choir. Now we speak of creation. We wish to fill in some of the blanks of information, as we often do from year to year, so that you start to see the common sense that spirit has regarding the creation of certain energies on the planet, the benevolence that goes into them, and the love. The nodes and the nulls are supposedly time capsules. And each one of these pairs would be able to open at the appropriate time. And the pairs would then require and provide a push-pull energy. They would open with real-time information from the Seven Sisters energy, which you call the Pleiadians. This energy when would be spread upon the planet in order to enhance spiritual evolution. This is the plan. You have opened a number of them. One pair was open profoundly in Bolivia. And now you sit with a full one-third in operation, 33%. This has activated all of them, and the earth starts to feel what you've done all through your song lines, all through what Yahi has been able to remember shockingly accurately for all these years. But there's more. Nodes and nulls are different. And they play a multiple role on the planet. They didn't just sit here waiting to be open for the initial purpose of the nodes of the planet. All by themselves, without nulls, the 12 nodes of this planet were the places where creation began. This is one of them. I gave you the story of Amishah. There are similar stories in 11 other places on this planet. They are listed in your books. And they all have the same kind of an attribute as opposed to a null. And the attributes of the nodes are that humans are able to get to them, to be at them easily. And if you could do some kind of research, you would find that almost every one of them was mystical to this day. That those who would live around them say that there's energy here and it's ancient beyond belief, years beyond counting. 
The difference with Amishaw is that hers was the only node where the purity was remained and not diluted. It's special here. But dear ones, what I am saying to you is that the creation story of the seven sisters used common sense with the great central source which you call God marrying to this planet all those years ago in 12 places, not one. Therefore, there was common sense applied. Does it make sense to you that God would have gone to one particular place and told the seven sisters, this is where you to see on the planet, only one place. Do you see how this would arise to problems? For then you would say, what were they like, this one place? Were they of color? Were they not of color? A rise in the human brain would be then biases of which God would like more. Do you see? <laughs> there would be biases aplenty. No, common sense has it started in 12 areas that are so different and so remote they would be all the colors. Indeed. All of the temperatures. Indeed. To provide cultures that were outstandingly different as they should be in free choice of humanity so that someday your differences you could put together. Common sense in spirituality is what we have talked about for some time. Spirit has benevolence. Let me define the lack of common sense. The lack of common sense would be bringing flies to Uluru. <laughs> For those of you seated here, that's funny. <laughs> the benevolence of God knows you. The benevolence of God and the way things have transpired over the years, purposely, beautifully balanced. The nodes have always been here and always been known. They are the creation centers of humanity. These represent the landings of the Pleiadian, who we we'll talk about in a moment. The nulls, these come online as we identify the pairs. And now we have another system, a system of balance from the creative source from the creation centers comes the information of the original Pleiadian homes. Push, pull. My partner does not understand that. And finally, I will say this only. We call the nodes and the nulls a push, pull system. As they come online, they become balanced. All that you know in physics, in chemistry, in science, has a system that is balanced. The very laws of physics require there be balance, that is to say, there be pairs. The very DNA molecule that you celebrate with your tones, they all come in pairs. There is a base 12 mathematics which is involved in all things, even consciousness, there is a push and a pull. This is the way of it in the galaxy, in your own life. It is also the way of it with nodes and nulls. With every note that is sung, there is an acknowledgement of the Pleiadian reality. A thing that we have spoken of so often, and yet not often enough. I want to expose a little more 
about something so beautiful that I warned my partner that it's emotional. I want you to connect the dots, dear ones. I know who's going to listen to these, these words apart from this room. I know there is unbelief that such a thing could be based upon the traditions of the now that are so different than the ancients. The idea that you might have been seeded, that is to say, biologically shifted and changed by another race from somewhere else in your galaxy is often thought to be the words of a fool. It isn't. It's a beautiful creation story shared by so many cultures that it cannot be a coincidence. Again, I invite in all benevolence and seriousness and beauty that the anthropologists would begin yet again to ask around to the cultures of this planet, especially around those places we call the nodes, what is your creation story? And there will be similarities in all of them. Not the identical story, but so much similarity that it points to M45. The little cluster in the sky, not the brightest one, not the most obvious one, but the one that's home. They celebrated here in their song lines. And they know who the ones with names you cannot pronounce are. And it is the same in Lemuria. It is the same in Shasta. It is the same over and over. How could these cultures have the same kinds of stories which even names the shapes in the sky after the mythological characters involved in the creation story itself. And they never met each other. They never knew what the others believed. And the only answer that you can come up with that is common sense is that there has to be a commonality with the Pleiadians. It is the creation story of the planet and it's beautiful. It continues to be beautiful. And I want to make it personal. There are those who will go into prayer and meditation all over the planet and they will see and they will feel God inside. You will connect to your higher self and you will know of the creative source. A monotheistic earth knows about God. I want to make this personal. Because the ones who planted the seeds in you know about the same God. Together, not apart, the Pleiadians are part of this system of God. And you do not know what you do not know, so when I tell you they are an ascended race, it doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't mean, for instance, that they have high technology. What if I told you that their highest technology was from the Creator itself? The master physicist reveals how things work eventually to a race that plugs in fully to the benevolent love of the Creator and is able to travel the galaxy with that knowledge and with the benevolence and with the wisdom of God, the same God that you pray to. 
It means that they are brothers and they are sisters. When you think of your parents, your biological parents, and perhaps they're gone, and yet have they gone, they live in you. There is so much within your DNA that still remains hidden and so much that is spiritual to the core that includes your ancestors. The life force that you celebrate within your own DNA that you call you also contains them. When you pass someday, you will pass this same life force into your children and they will think of you and know that you still exist in some way in their memories in their minds just as your mother and your father do. And it doesn't matter what happened during this time or how you were raised or whether there was benevolence in the family or not, you still carry them their intent and their benevolence of God in you. You can still access them. You can still ask for forgiveness or vice versa with them. And the proof of this is in the indigenous. For all of them call upon the ancestors, speak to the ancestors, and know it is a living legacy, not one which is dead. The Pleiadians are still here. A year ago, almost, we told Yah-E that his mother was Pleiadian. And we told him that she still is here. And here is what I want to tell you. I want you to to understand this is so personal. The seed biology of the ancients lives in you, lives in you. Not as a concept, but as those who are still here. Listen, dear ones, there is a system. When one race seeds another, in this galaxy through benevolence and the love of God they come here and they cannot go home because they imbue themselves into the dirt of the earth and the rocks they become the grids and they live in the humans who are here knowing they can never return that they would be part of the planet in the nodes they remain as long as you, as a human, are here, they are here. I implore you to know them, for they've always been in you, just as your mother and your father are in you. The next meditation, the next notes that you sing, I want you to feel the warmth of their smile and their embrace as finally, perhaps, there would be humanity that might say thank you for loving me. Dear ones, we are on sacred land. more than any you have been on due to what you would call the undisturbed energy of the continent for so many years. And because of this, the Ananu have secrets. Now since 1987, some of the most profound secrets of the indigenous on the planet are starting to be revealed. Some by the elders themselves and the ancients and some not. This is not an accident. 
for the time is right for some of these things to be known. The Ananu are not going to reveal the secrets for it is not for them to do. I will not be revealing them all but the ones that are appropriate and germane to this conversation and the beauty and the benevolence of what we teach I want you to know. I continue to tell my partner he is not saying this correctly but the intent is there. One of the biggest secrets you should know is the most profound one that they carry. Twelve nodes were all seated at the same time on this planet. And over thousands of years, what you would expect would happen did. There was variety. There were situations that would cause the bloodline to be less pure, but not here. The very blood that they carry around, which makes them who they are, is only one step removed from the Pleiadian. One step. No one has that. As you might expect, and something perhaps you did not, is that in this one step that is pure, they have things within them that is not in anyone else on the planet. And through their consciousness, if they choose to develop it, they can perform things that you cannot. One step removed from their Pleiadian parents. There are things I wish I could tell you, but I can only hint at it. They are seers of energy that are Pleiadian that you cannot. They are watchers of the rock. Did you ever wonder what they are watching for? And why would they watch it for 44,000 years? <laughs> Is it simply tradition? I will tell you, it's not. Interesting, is it not, that so many of these nodes have anomalies. If you find a node that is easy to get to, and there are a lot of people who would visit them, there is an attribute you might be aware of. People see things. Sometimes there's lights in the night when there shouldn't be. Sometimes there's energies that are unexplainable. The Ananu have seen the lights. There are places in the rock that glow. And the watchers know that these are the ones that have never left. And the communication is still there. They're not lights. They're their parents. The rock speaks to them in the song of creation and their dreams and their song lines that no one on the planet has but them. They must keep it to themselves for to share it would be to dilute it. And they know it. I do not give away anything that is too precious. I tell you instead or oh, why the respect should be here. And I also tell you what they know now. That the earth is changing. They have prophecies. They will not tell you. That would describe the second precession of the equinoxes. As the time of ascension. And when they look at what has happened within their own mob in these years, 
It may not occur to them that this is the prophecy. There'll come a time when the song line of the Ananu is only represented in the beauty of the wind and the sound between the rocks. When all that was them will be represented in the life force that is the rock. The time will come when the rock not too far from here, which you call Uluru, will be more sacred than it is today. And that regular humanity will go and they will not touch it and they will not climb it. Because they will recognize within it something precious and beautiful and pure. The Ananu will never leave this planet. They will become the watchers of it. They're always here in some way, in their beauty and in that which is pure. They know this. They sing about it. They are the oldest. Profound secrets they carry about their own lineage biologically as well. If an Ananu were to mate with any other kind of non-pure human, the gifts will not pass. Therefore they represent chemically, genetically, something which is unusual and special on the planet. In other words, science can prove that they are different. They're seers of the earth. Part of the earth is their consciousness. They are not a part as you are. I want you to think about these things. The next time you see one, I want you to understand the respect that is here and the beauty that is here. This is their home. The songs that you sing, these are a connection to the divine. They have them, you have them. It should show you, dear ones, that you share something profound. The understanding through the song lines of the beauty of the creation. This is why you're here. Dear ones, the Kryon teaching has always centered on the human. Not on things around the human, but always the human. The reason Kryon is here at all is because of the intense and profound shifts at hand now. If 20 years ago we described what is happening in this room and that you would participate and be doing what you're doing, many of you would say that is not correct. <laughs> it's a shift of consciousness, even of perception, maybe even allowance. Allowance that you would push past what you were taught. An allowance that would let you prove what is happening to you by breaking the barrier of your disbelief. And this is what we are asking you now. As eclectic as you might be, singing the tones against each other in the way that you have been taught, not really understanding what they do, but feeling what they do. Even that eclecticness does not compare with where it's going. I want you to have a better appreciation of who you are. Close your eyes and pretend that the sun has gone down. Tonight, perhaps, you would get away from the facility and all the lights 
and glance at the sky. It'll take your breath away. For it lights up. And you can even see nearby galaxies. Number of stars in your Milky Way. So great. You can only see a fraction and yet it will take your breath away. This is the ceiling <laughs> of the home of those who are pure. It's what they have every single night. So you can see that they have searched their own, I would say, lineage, and they know who they are. But I don't think you do. Tonight I would like you to stare at the stars for just a little while. And under your breath you might even ask, who am I? And it's bigger than you know. The first thing I ask you is, do you think it's possible within the myriad of the tens of thousands of stars you can see, do you think it's possible that any of them might have a solar system like yours? And the answer is, of course. And then I ask you this, of those that you can only see with the naked eye, do you think any of those solar systems might have a sweet spot for a planet like yours? Just right. Creatures like you, with the DNA like you, who can look back and ponder their Milky Way purview and wonder about you. Is it possible that as you look upon the skies, you are not seeing stars, but you are seeing consciousness teeming through the galaxy? And I will tell you, yes. I will go even further. I want you to ask that of spirit. Tonight, as you look at the stars in silence and see if the answer comes back, we know who you are. Everybody does. And that is what you're unaware of. In far, far away places, consciousnesses of others that have been told about a magic place where other creatures like them, who have DNA like them, can do something they can't. spiritual evolution they can change even shape shift eventually with nothing more than consciousness as they absorb the love of God as they change the very structure of their societies as they become benevolent as they begin to love one another in ways that you have not even seen yet one society to another. You don't know that this is a gift and that others cannot and that perhaps it's only a fairy tale to a myriad of civilizations who have, who have your story in their traditions, in their mythology. There's a star in the sky who will make a difference to the galaxy. And you look out and wonder if you're alone. <laughs> There's more than you think here. It shouts with the love of God and the beauty and the power of the human being. This is the shift that we have told you is here. Still with free choice. You can make it go as fast and as slow as you wish. But this is the place to look up and ask, who am I? And this is the place for you to receive an answer. And that answer will be magnificent.
Dear ones, it is a short finale. When I remind you again of where you are. And this is the place where we will then give you the matched pair for Uluru. The node and the null. But before we do, new information about nodes and nulls that we have never spoken before. This now is connecting the dots, things that make sense to an energy around you that is not static. That is to say, everything affects everything else. Let us put together a musical term and use it in physics. It is sonority. Sonority is a difficult thing to describe musically, but musically it is the difference between the relationship of notes. If you hear a major chord, it has a certain sonority. A minor has a different sonority. And so we say to you, consciousness has a different sonority. The various aspects of what you would call positive and negative work together to create a specific sonority. The reason I give you this is to tell you that all along the things that we teach are multidimensional. So you have to think out of the box of linearity. There are 12 nodes and 12 nulls. We've told you there is a match for every single one, but we did not tell you it is the same match from day to day. <laughs> there are only two that are permanent and always had to go together. One is the pair which involved Maui, Hawaii, and the other was the pair that involved Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. All of the others could have gone anywhere depending upon the consciousness of the planet and when they were announced. This may not suit the linearity that you want for things that never change. Welcome to a new reality. Once they're identified, they are mated forever. But until they are identified loosely, I will tell you they could be anywhere. Uluru has settled. You are here. There are three places it could have gone. The one that it settled in today makes total sense and the sonority is beautiful. The match to Uluru is Mount Logan, Northern Territories of Canada. If you take a look at the pristineness, the beauty, and all of the things that you would have here as an opposite polarity, it is Mount Logan. The height, the majesty, the temperature. <laughs> all the opposites. <laughs> Go from this place, change forever. And so it is.